Chris Watts convicted of murdering his pregnant wife and two daughters. How well do you know your spouse? We have a daytime exclusive with his neighbor who handed over the video Watch, I'll show you. that led to his arrest. And Kelsey Barrett still missing. How much does her fiance really know? Plus, breaking news. A woman in a vegetative state for over a decade gives birth. Will police find her rapist? It's one of the most deplorable murder cases I've ever heard. A pregnant mother, Shanann Watts, and her two daughters, Cece and Bella, killed at the hands of her husband, their father, Chris Watts. Today, an exclusive interview with a neighbor close to the family who's now being called a hero for helping police put Chris Watts behind bars. What made a man most people thought was a loving husband and dad turn into a killer? The story shocked the world. A devastated father pleading for the return of his pregnant wife and their two small daughters, who'd vanished after his wife returned from a weekend business trip. If you're out there, just come back. If somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. To the outside world and on social media, Chris and Shanann Watts appeared a picture-perfect couple, shown smiling together with their two young girls and happily anticipating the birth of their third. But just hours after his impassioned plea for their return, Chris oil in gas tanks. The police investigation would also uncover a secret sordid flip side to the family man facade that included multiple mistresses, financial turmoil, and possible psychopathy. Chris Watts ultimately pleaded guilty to felony charges related to his family's murder. The most uh, inhumane and vicious crime that I have handled out of the thousands of cases that I have seen. Watts was sentenced to life in prison, leaving Shanann's devastated friends and family with many unanswered questions. What really turned Chris Watts from a seemingly devoted husband and father into a cruel, cold-blooded killer. Nate joins me now. He lived next door to the Watts family. He provided security footage that was instrumental. It's a piece of evidence in the case. He joins me now in a daytime exclusive interview. When you first heard that Shanann, your neighbor, Cece, Bella's beautiful little girls, were mm -hmm. missing, what did you think? What went through your mind? At first, I couldn't believe that they were missing. If they were, I couldn't really, I didn't know at the time if they were missing or not. So basically what I did was went to my security camera footage, checked it out, went back to the police and told them basically what I had. And they eventually wanted to come in and look at it. Of you. I, I'm you. going to congratulate you and thank you for this because we all have more power than we think. This is a great example. A neighbor realizes the problem, takes advantage of whatever resources he has and you end up changing the destiny of this case. How would you describe Chris Watts as a neighbor? And if you don't mind, Shannon and the girls as well, what were they like? Um, Chris was real quiet. He would always wave or I'd sometimes talk to you. But he was kind of, you could tell he was kind of standoffish. There was times when he just didn't want to wave or didn't want to say anything. But usually he was nice. And Shanann was always really friendly. She came over, welcomed us to the neighborhood. The girls were always running around, laughing, having a great time. So. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary? No, nothing at all. And when you first looked at that security footage, and you, know, and you saw that this truck had backed up in the morning that they disappeared, you never saw the kids leave, or Shanann, but you saw the truck back up. What did you think he was doing? Um, he said he was loading tools, but I thought that was a little bit odd because I had never seen him really back his truck into the driveway ever. He always parked it out front. So I definitely thought it was kind of odd. And then when you saw him loading stuff into the cab of the truck and never anything into the back, I really thought that was definitely odd. Is that when you began to think maybe those are bodies he's actually loading into his truck? I don't know if at that point in time I thought it was bodies, but at the time I thought stuff wasn't adding up. 
So you showed the footage to, to the police, uh -huh. right? and then, and then you showed it to Chris Watts. Yep. And, and that encounter, actually, point to everybody, was recorded. You know how police have those body cams? So a police officer body camera recorded this. So take a look at, at what that camera showed. And this is him at 517. We park out there on the side. I just want to get everything back in. Be easier to load everything out there, all the tools that I had to bring in. Um, my detective just showed up, um, so he'll probably want to talk to you. I have your mark right here. Yeah. Should be someone I can see now. where someone tried to jimmy with a flathead screwdriver. Oh, it'll pick up anything coming down the street this way. You know where that trigger is? Oh, yeah. Okay. Watch, I'll show you. So we're all watching that behavior that you were there for. Uh -huh. What did you think of that encounter with Chris? It was definitely very odd. I'm, I'm more of a watcher. I watch people more than, you know, talk to everybody. I kind of sit back and watch. So to see him putting his hands on his head and see him nervous looking around, constantly on his phone. The other thing I thought that was definitely weird was he wasn't watching the footage at all. He would look at it for a second, then go back to his phone or look at it for a second, then look away. And if my family was missing, I would be glued to that TV 100% to see if I could see absolutely anything. Those are incredibly profound observations. Thank That's you. That's right. I'd be glued, trying to get ahead of the case, not trying to keep up with it. Which yeah, I would, I would have been on that TV seeing if there was any, anything that showed anything about my family. And the fact that he wasn't watching it at all, he kept looking up and looking around and petting my dog and stuff like that, I just thought that was odd. I'm going to say it again, but you reflect the power of what seems like an ordinary man. Yeah. I mean, you're not a detective. No. Right? You're not a police officer. By no means. But you picked up on a lot of subtle things <coughs> that I hadn't thought of until you mentioned them up there. I bet most of us hadn't. Yeah, I definitely just thought it was odd the way he was acting, and he was kind of swaying back and forth a lot, putting his hands on his head, and yeah. he accidentally knocked his sunglasses down, and just little stuff like that where I was like... Why are you so nervous? Yes. You should show more concern than nervousness. I know you've talked publicly in the past about hearing Chris and Shanann argue. And you made a commitment, which I'm proud of you for making, of not speaking about it in detail. Why? why? Um, I don't want everyone to look at this case and think, oh my gosh, they argued all the time. That's not what we're focused on. We're fo I, I want to focus on Shanann and the girls and what a great life they had instead of, oh my gosh, they fought all the time, he was so mean to her. At the time, I embellished a little bit as far as they fought constantly, and I didn't want that to come out that way. It was more like they didn't fight any more than any other couple. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, where houses are so close, it's kind of hard not to notice when people are outside and doing stuff like that. But it wasn't like he was constantly yelling at her. He was super mean. They had a couple confrontations that I happened to see. Yeah. But it was never him being this big, huge monster. And I've just noticed on social media, they really focus on that. And that's not what I want to focus on. Yeah. It's not right for the family either. I honor you for trying to protect them. Thank you. Up next, Nate weighs in on the rumors about Chris Watts' alleged secret relationships. And what does he think about him now? We'll be right back. I'm back with an exclusive interview with a neighbor who helped put killer dad, Chris Watts, behind bars. Let's talk about these other rumors regarding Chris. There's a rumor that he has had other girlfriends, uh, and there's a rumor that he had a sexual relationship with another man. What are your thoughts on those um, two allegations? I don't really, I didn't really know at the time he had a girlfriend, because from the outside it looks like a normal everyday family, husband's going to work, coming home. So I didn't really know much about that. And as far as a relationship with a male, it seems kind of odd to me considering he had pictures of his girlfriend, stuff like that. Yeah. So I just don't believe that that happened. You knew Chris Watts when you thought he was a normal guy. Yep. But now that you're aware of the brutality 
of the crimes that he committed against his wife and his beautiful children, and even an unborn child. What do you think of him now? Um, part of me thinks he's a monster. For you to be able to do that to your wife and especially your kids. Like, I love my son more than anything, and I could never see myself hurting him at all. Yeah. And the fact that he could go out of his way to take her life and the kid's life and then act like nothing happened and try to cover it up just shows his character. Yeah. So the, he got sentenced to five consecutive life sentences. Yes. With no chance for parole. Do you think that's what he deserved? Um, after talking to her family, Shanann's family, and finding out that they felt like it wasn't their place to see, seek the death penalty. And my personal opinion on it is, is I think sitting in a jail cell thinking about what you did every day is a lot more punishment than sitting on a death row and constantly thinking about your case and how I'm going to beat it and how I'm going to... It would give him other things to think about instead of what he should be thinking about, which is his family and what he did to them. I really want to applaud you. Thank Not you. Not just for what you did, but it reminds all of us the power each of us has. God bless you. Coming up, the heartbreaking medical reason we know Chris Watts' daughter, Bella, fought back for her life. And what is life like in prison for Chris Watts? Is he really receiving love letters from hundreds of women? That's the rumor. It's next. We're back talking about the horrific case of Chris Watts, who was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole for the brutal murders of his wife, Shanann, daughters Bella and Cece, and an unborn son. I'm joined by our crime panel, crime correspondent Melissa Moore, forensic psychiatrist Dr. Clay Watson, and former homicide prosecutor Anasiga Nicolazzi. And we just heard two important revelations from the Watts neighbor, Nate. He now says Chris and Shannon did not argue more than most of the couples, backtracking on what he had said in earlier interviews. And he doesn't believe the recent stories that Chris had a sexual relationship with another man. And as you get your thoughts as a prosecutor about both of those issues. There's still so many question marks and unknowns in this case, and unfortunately the only way we ever get to the actual true answers are if Chris Watts ever decides to tell the truth. We don't know if he will. The bottom line, though, regardless, is this, is that this is a man who wanted a new life, and he was willing to kill to get it. His wife and his beautiful little girls, Bella and Cece, his unborn son, Nico, became nothing but more mere objects to him mm -hmm. that stood in his way. In all my years as a prosecutor, I've obviously seen so many terrible things, but this one, when I heard some of the details about the brutality and the heartlessness of what this man did, to his family, it actually made me shut my eyes and pause. I'm trying to understand how he didn't reveal some of this heinous character earlier in his life. Now, just to give you an example, a four-year-old Bella, that's the older daughter, she fought back so aggressively against her dad's attack uh, that she actually tore her frenulum. Frenulum is a tissue beneath your tongue that attaches your tongue to, to the bottom of your mouth, that she'd bitten her tongue so many times before she died, just trying to hold on to life. Clay, as a psychiatrist, when you see this kind of brutality, especially to someone so dear to, to you, your daughter, what does that tell you about the mind of Chris Watts? So first of all, it is, it's hard to even uh, conceptualize. It's inconceivable what Chris Watts was able to do to his family. As a forensic psychiatrist, I've sat with a number of individuals who have killed. In uh, this case, as you mentioned, is something that uh, goes beyond anything that most of us ever get to see. But as a forensic psychiatrist, what do I look for when I'm talking with these killers? I'm looking for evidence of a mental health disorder. I'm looking for uh, an abnormal personality structure like uh, antisocial personality or psychopathy or narcissistic personality disorders or uh, it could even be a situation where it's an abnormal reaction to a normal, normal daily problems of life that some, people, uh, that some people have. In this particular case, when there is the killing of a child by a parent, 
there are only a few categories, and this is one category that this would likely fit into, is the unwanted child. And in those particular cases, the unwanted child is seen as a barrier to a new life, sort of a new flourishing uh, romantic relationship. And uh, the parent needs to clear that barrier in order to move forward. But also, Dr. Clay, I noticed he wasn't wearing his wedding ring in some of the footage already. So even when he's talking to the public, he didn't have his wedding ring on. And when he was talking to the public, I didn't see any strain on his face. I didn't see any puffiness or bloodshot eyes. You know, something that I would think you would be, you'd be crying a lot at night. You'd be devastated. And no bags under his eyes from lack of sleep. I mean, those are some of the, the physical things I saw from him. And when we talk about manipulation, and that's a great point, um, you, that is probably the least of the transgressions we know what he's capable of. He has carried out the most inhuman acts possible. So now the manipulations, the lies, the everything to cover up after, those are easy hurdles now. Those, that's the least of his transgressions. Everything that most people are unable to even conceive of, he's able and has done. And so, uh, so the manipulation is uh, just, just part and parcel. So Chris's sentencing, Shanann's parents and Chris's mom all spoke. It was very, very emotional. Who gave you the right to take their lives? You monster. Thought you would get away with this. To my son Christopher, we have loved you from the beginning, and we still love you now. So Melissa, I mean, you live this in part because your yeah. father's a serial killer. How are Chris's and Shanann's families coping with this, the brutality of how this was done? I, I, are they even speaking to each other? Well, it, from my experience working with families, it takes a long time to talk to each other, but I hope that they are talking to each other because Chris is not giving very much information. And I feel like together, if they were to communicate, I know they have a lot of a lot of questions and they want answers. But I think some of them could answer some of the things for them because I think Chris gave some puzzle, you know, like little fragments to one, one family member and then to another family member. And maybe together they can come up with some answers, you know, together. But I think what's interesting is watching that footage and watching his face. Mm -hmm. When I watched him in trial, he was looking down and he only cried when his mom spoke huh. and said, we still love you. When it was about him, that's when he started crying. Crying for himself. Mm -hmm. Crying for himself. Anastasia, the mistress. I understand she's been cooperating fully with police. By all accounts, she has been completely cooperative with law enforcement. This is a woman who worked with Chris Watts, and his story to her was that he was separated in the process of a divorce, which we all know now is far from the truth. Mm -hmm. She herself, reports say, that she went to the police when she learned that Shannon and the girls were missing. She went first. She went first. And there are also these reports, and Melissa, I'll address this to you, that women all over the country are writing this man, frankly, from all over the world, love letters. <laughs> love letters to this man. You've been digging into and have obtained some exclusive information about what he's going through in jail. Right, and What's that his daily life like? Yeah, that doesn't surprise me that women are reaching out to him. I mean, look at Scott Peterson. I mean, this is, he's going to be in that same line and, and being getting money in his commissary and uh, being supported. I think for women on the outside that are attracted to guys like this, they're safe, they're safer, I guess. Um, but also the fact that they can save them, that they can maybe turn their lives around, they'll be the one that, that rescued them. And I, I've seen that in the case with my father even. I've, I've seen letters that he's received. I know he got visitation from multiple women, models, some celebrities even too. Um, as far as Chris being in prison, I've heard from my sources that he was booed by the other inmates when he entered, that also he's becoming despondent, that he's starting to realize the gravity of his sentence. And you know, some people will say, oh, he's feeling remorse for the crimes. I don't think that at all. I think he's definitely understanding that this is a life sentence and there's no way out of it. Um, also, I've heard that he was moved from Colorado prison for the safety of himself, but also, you know, I, some people might think like, well, who cares about his safety? Look what he did to his kids. But it's really also for the safety of the staff, the guards, because if they have to break up a fight or attack, then they're, you know, they're in harm's way. The lowest of the low is killing your own offspring. I know. Right, and there's a prisoners. hierarchy too. Yeah. There is a hierarchy in prison where men who attack their children or pedophiles are the lowest of the low. So even in this is a you know high-profile case. So 
He's got a target on his back. Thank you for your wonderful insights. Coming up, another shocking story of a missing Colorado mom. And now her fiance is charged with her murder. What happened to Kelsey Bereth? That's next. Is this a person who can act without any remorse? Is this a person who does little things that sort of leaks information to say, okay, you don't have your ring on, you don't, you, you don't have any problem with sleep, you're acting sort of strange during uh, the, the watching of video uh, as we saw uh, previously. But the other piece that's important here is the brutality in which he carried out these killings. And, and again, it's hard to imagine that a father and a husband can do these things, but the brutality that can come usually comes in these killings from a high emotional state. And that emotional state may do, be due to extreme panic or anger or extreme resentment. But and here, I mean, tell me if, if you would agree with this, Clay, sure. doctor, say, hey, this man is so cold and calculated. Most people want to move on. They know they can go and get a divorce. Yeah. Here he decides he doesn't want to be tethered with alimony, visitation. And so he, what he decides to do is to take their lives of these people that were supposed to be those that he cherished the most. The nucleus around them. But what's Chris haunted me too, what's haunted me the most is that he was able to sleep at night with his girls in those those oil bins. And I heard from the authorities when they tried to retrieve the little girls that one of the little girls' hands degloved. Like oh. that, I mean, there's moments in cases that are so, there's just parts of cases that stick with you. And I think for those, the, the people who had to retrieve them, that they have to remember that, you know? Well, you think to, that Chris Watts would be yeah. unable to do things most of us can do just without eating at him. Mm -hmm. He was interrogated for hours by police before finally admitting to his own dad that he killed his wife. Look at this gripping footage. <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking about the father putting his hands like this as he hears his own son, his own flesh, tell him that he has killed the grandkids and the daughter-in-law. What, what does this tell us about what was going on in the mind of Chris Watts? At that point, um, Chris Watts has to survive. He's in survival mode. So everything that he says at this point forward is all about self-preservation. So he is talking to his father and giving his father one story, gave police another story. And, and in all of it, and very much similar to the killings and the disposing of the body, everything is about his wants and needs above all else. So he's going to do what he needs to do because he wants to realize a new life. He can't realize the new life without telling more lies. And so if we go through all the steps that was necessary from the time of planning the killings to carrying out the killings to disposing of the bodies to then trying to avoid detection, most of us, the vast majority of individuals, are not capable of the degree of compartmentalization that's needed to carry out those things. And now he is being interrogated and he has to be able to come up with a story, and that story is all about his own self-preservation so he can move on to his new life. But don't you think there was manipulation there too? Because if he tells this to his father, then his father will somehow have a twist of empathy, like he was trying to keep his parents on his side. But it's really Do something that as prosecutors, we always say that at the, the certain points that a defendant or suspect will admit what they have to and deny what they can. He knows the gig is up. He knows they're going to know something basic. So what can he quickly switch gears and tell a story that maybe gets him out of most of this? So that's what you almost see. He wants this new life. He knows that he's not going to walk away scot-free. So he came up with a new story that he tried to enlist his father's support. And the story that. was that his wife had actually already killed the kids. Exactly. Right. So you hear my wife is the monster and I as this loving father snap when my children have been taken from this woman and now out of my state of just incredible anger at what she did to my ch my children now I went ahead and killed her we are back with our true crime panel and I want to talk about another murder of a Colorado mom Kelsey Barrett who went missing on Thanksgiving Day her fiance Patrick Frazee has now been charged with her murder and Asika, you've prosecuted many successful cases. What's going on in this? What would you be thinking in this murder investigation? 
Well, as you said, Kelsey was last seen going into a supermarket with her one-year-old daughter, Kaylee, on Thanksgiving Day. Then it was silence. A couple days later, her phone pinged over 700 miles away in Idaho. Hmm. Same day, her employer gets a text that she's no, not going to be in work the following week. From her phone? Her phone. Then nothing. Just complete, no one knew anything. Fast forward now to December 21st. Her fiance, Patrick Frazy, was arrested for her murder. Very important to note that her body has not, and at that point certainly hadn't been found. He was charged with two counts of murder, one under the theory that he intentionally killed her, the second that he killed her during the course of another crime, in this case robbery. And interestingly, there's three other counts of solicitation to commit murder, that he enlisted or tried to enlist the help of another person on three different occasions to help him kill Kelsey or to kill her after his home was searched. Now this is a case that is new developments are coming almost daily. And some of the most latest and biggest are that in Idaho, a woman has been looked at as possibly being the one who helped them dispose of this phone. Looking at her more, there are reports saying that she as a nurse is someone who had a relationship with Patrick going as far back as 2016. And the breaking news is that a couple has come forward from Idaho to say that they as far back as October were told by an employee of theirs that she had been contacted by another woman to say that a man named Patrick was looking for her help to kill his fiance. And it was only when they saw Kelsey's mother imploring the public to help find her daughter. They started to put the pieces together. They contacted the FBI. Four days later, he's arrested. So it makes a difference. When you guys speak and see things, it matters.